Welcome to the Raw Coding YouTube channel. My name is Anton and today we're going to be programming in HTML. That's right, in HTML. Now, there are two camps, basically ones that say HTML is a programming language or it's not a programming language. Now, there can be a debate about this, but there is no debate. I basically made HTML into a programming language, so now it is. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Here I have app.html file and the programming language just like C-sharp requires a main function. So we create a function and we call it main. We will start humble and we will print a hello world to the console. Open up the terminal, we will use .NET run. Now, just like Python, I have an interpreter. Mine is written .NET. I can't publish it as a CLI tool, although here it's in local development. So .NET run this app.html file and we're gonna get hello world printed to the console. Another thing that I can do is I can take world out and I can declare a variable. I will say that this variable is Bob. I can give it a name and let's say that the name is name. And I want to greet this name. Let's say this is going to be self-closing. We'll rerun the application and we're going to get hello, Bob. Now you may be in a situation where, you know, you want to make it look pretty. You're going to run this. You're going to get a bunch of this stuff. So I have a special html programming keyword called value which is going to print out the value as is essentially okay you're gonna have something like this and now you're back at hello bob much like any other programming language we can actually pass arguments into the application so in the function we would have to specify parameters and this will be last name let's say i'll create another variable this is going to be first name this is going to be full name and i want to create a full name out of first name and last name so first goes first name self-closing and then we have a last name so first name is defined over here a last name is coming from the parameters we will then take full name and print it out to the console so full name right over here if we run the application first of all we get an exception because well last name doesn't exist so this will be bob foo and we get Bob Foo printed out like this. Now we do need a little bit of space. So val keyword to the rescue. And this value is a space self-closing. Rerun the application and we'll get Bob Foo. Now pretty standard stuff at this point. We can kick it up a notch and I don't have comments in here implemented. So we're going to have to delete most of this and I'll create another function. And this function is going to be called fizzbuzz. It's going to have a parameter of number. We'll take fizzbuzz. We're gonna pass a parameter into it. So this is just going to be n. If you're wondering how the parameters are bound, they are basically positionally bound, right? So this is the first in position. So it's gonna be bound to the first parameter. If you want more, you specify them via commas. Inside the fizzbuzz function, because I don't have and statements and stuff like this, because it was too long to code out essentially. I will say that if equals comparing modulo of number by three equals to zero, this should be fizz. And this is the value that I want to return from the fizzbuzz function. I will then copy this, do the same over here. Make sure I put this on a new line indent the whole thing and now it looks horrible take modulo of five this will give me buzz inside this if statement over here i'm gonna put another if statement i'll just take this over here put it over here if we have the number modulo three equals zero we're gonna get fizz and then before we hit fizz we do another if statement where we check if the number modulo five equals zero we will get fizz buzz okay here is essentially fizz buzz in html i know it you know, I, I haven't gotten around to making a linter and stuff like that yet. So, you know, it's a joke. It's not coming. All right. Uh, let's say we will start off with one. A big fat error because for parameter, I was meant to say parameters because there could be multiple ones. So for one, we don't get anything. If we have three, this is fizz. If we have five, this is buzz. If we have 15, this is fizz buzz. Let's check nine. And that is again fizz. So essentially a fizz buzz application. Now let's go on a little bit of a rant. What is a programming language? We have this thing over here, HTML, which is sometimes regarded not as a programming language because it's a hypertext markup language. So if you're looking at this, you may think this is not a hypertext markup language. This is a hypertext 
programming language. I personally think that latching onto the markup word is very pedantic and maybe a little bit counterproductive to trying to see what a programming language actually is. If we look at programming in the real world, where I can use the English language to essentially teach you something, so I say some words, you can now think a certain way or do a certain thing or, you know, just repeat what I said. What I'm really trying to do is take an idea and use words to point to parts of that idea and transfer that idea to you. With computers, we're kind of doing the same thing. We have an idea and then we have to take this idea, cut it up into pieces and put them into these blocks, which the programming language gives us. You have the idea, you then want to transfer that idea into the computer and the way that you do it is using the programming language. Now the programming language that sits in the middle is essentially a reflection of your idea. The quality of the programming language is essentially determined by how well it can take your idea and transfer it to the computer or, you know, if they market it or something, if somebody says, oh, Rust is the best programming language, whatever. Now, programming languages can give you different building blocks. You can either be a free thinker and do whatever you want, but you may essentially mess everything up. If a programming language is constrained and it forces you to think a certain way, you might find it that it actually alleviates some of the problems or that thinking in this way actually makes solving problems easier. Now, if you remember to the time before you ever learned programming and you think about how did you think about problems? Was it ever in classes? Whenever you looked at things, did you think, Ah, oh, yeah, there is a class hierarchy here with overloaded methods. Or did you compose things together? Let me know in the comments how you think you thought about solving problems before you started programming. What I'm trying to say here is that you have some kind of idea and you want to reflect it in the computer. You may do it through pointers, you may do it through classes, you may do it through functions, you may do it through nodes in your HTML, XML, or you may use CSS, or you may use some kind of website builder, or you may use some kind of other system. In my opinion, a programming language is a programming language as long as it has some kind of notation that allows you to take your idea and reflect it in the computer. It doesn't matter so much the notation with which you use to transfer your idea. It's more about being able to describe your idea. And I think uh, that sums it up nicely. Let's actually, for those who are interested, maybe take a little bit of a look at how this looks like. If you are my patron supporter, you can take a look at the source code. I have a couple of tests over here, which basically test programs. Here's a Fibonacci sequence program that I've tweeted about. If you don't follow me on Twitter, you know what to do. Let's close the use cases. And here is the entry point to the application. We have the HTML where we pick up the file. And then you have the interpreter where I basically pass in the strategy for STD in and pass along all the other arguments. Now, the interpreter is the main thing which is going to execute, load the main function, and then recursively visits the XML node tree and parses all of these instructions out of here. So the interpreter interprets the program and resolves the relevant instructions. Then the main thing to understand is, let's say, interfaces and defaults are really just the plumbing for the application to describe some things. One of the other main building blocks here is the execution scope. If we take a look at app HTML, uh, the body of the main function is one main execution scope where we will say this is the first instruction to essentially declare a function. If we take a look at some of the keywords for this language, a function, what it will do is it will take the current execution scope and it's going to set a variable. So a function exists as a variable in the global execution scope and then a function essentially executes just a, like a regular value. So you can basically say that this HTML programming language is indeed a functional programming language where Things like val, variable, fn, these are all variables which are in turn functions. Everything is a function in here essentially. And if you have a variable in the outer scope, if the variable with the same name exists in the inner scope, first we check the inner scope and then let's say in the execution scope, we will try to get variable. If we don't find it in the current scope, 
we go to the parent scope. So we can get functions from parent scopes and from the global scope, etc. The execution scope in this case isn't much different from the curly braces, which define this execution scope over here. The language is dynamic. Everything is pretty much a string up until a point where I'm trying to consume them for these arithmetic operations or Boolean operations. So for example, in Boolean comparison, when I'm actually trying to get these objects, right? I'm checking, are these Booleans that I'm getting? Are these integers? Are these strings? Are these integers and strings, right? Everything is pretty dynamic up until the point I am trying to use it. And same with numbers over here, where you, when you have things like uh, add, subtract, multiply, divide, modulo, they will try to be pretty generic where each individual child is going to be evaluated. And then if it's an integer, we just use it as an integer. If it's a string, we then actually try to parse it. If it's something else, we don't know how to parse it. Other things that I could potentially do here is you know, if I get a Boolean like true, I can say, okay, uh, this is going to be one. If I get false, you guessed it, this could be automatically converted to zero. And that's if I want to do something like that. Not much to say about other op operations. You have print, which pretty much just takes every single child, tries to convert it to string as long as it's not this empty thing, which is basically a null. So this programming language doesn't actually have nulls. The return statement is pretty interesting. What it's going to do is it's going to try to evaluate whatever is contained within it. And then in the execution scope, whenever we are trying to evaluate a node, so if the node, we try to interpret it, if it is a return statement, we execute it. So whatever child statements are inside of it are going to get executed. We're going to get the final result. We're going to flip the state machine on the current execution scope that we're returning, return the final result. We're going to short circuit any other statements, which are essentially in the block and whatever evaluation was happening is essentially going to stop. Otherwise, all of these things implement the I expression interface where the expression can either be executed with no arguments or it can be executed with arguments. Arguments are really only consumed in the function where by order these arguments are bound into these parameter names over here, which is pretty primitive code over here because this programming language is not essentially going to be used for real. I didn't put too much effort into this. Otherwise, when you have things like variable, you specifically look for the attributes like name where you then try to extract the value. And before you set the value, you're going to iterate over all the nodes. So you can imagine that the way the execution generally goes is with functions, you first define a function. So the body of the function never executes. This kind of just gets kept captured. And then before you print, what you really do is you evaluate n and then you evaluate fizzbuzz, which then executes the function and the value then gets printed. So the last most node gets executed first, where the function is kind of like a lazy execution thing. If you understand trees and recursion, this is going to feel pretty natural. And I think uh, that is pretty much it for the tour. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section. If you want to know more about how to build this sort of thing, I have a video on the interpreter pattern. Go ahead and watch that. I'll leave a link in the description. If you want the source code for this video and my other videos, please come support me on my Patreon. Very, very big thank you to all of my current Patreon supporters. Your help is very much appreciated. As always, thank you for watching. Have a good day.